like I said, the, the, most of the rest of this is going to be a lot lighter. Um, we've hit the all of the algorithms, which astonishingly seems to be one, um, just in lots of different guises and different ways of implementing it. So now we're just going to keep talking about where we see these things, how we use them, what we do with them. All right, I just did this. Oh, because I moved the mouse off of the window. I think they would actually make that work right. There's not much here. Uh, um, if you're doing an alternate path project and you want to do a presentation on the 13th of April, you need to let me know. If I don't hear from you, I'm going to assume that you don't want to. Um, I would actually strongly encourage you to do that because I will consider that to be part of your final report. And also, it will be good for other people in the class to see what you crazy things you've actually done with distributed systems, even if it's probably about a tenth of what you had hoped to accomplish. Welcome to distributed systems. No, no required readings here. There are some papers linked in the slides, but I don't... I imagine, do any of you actually go and read any of those papers ever? Oh, okay. Uh, did you read, which one? PMMC, yeah. I actually don't like the PMMC paper. Um, but I understand where they're coming from. I just don't like it. Because I think that they skip too many of those intermediate steps that you don't quite know why they're doing things the way they do them which means it's not a good intro paper, but this is what, this is what we gave the world. Uh, anybody have any questions? I almost used, uh, there was a student who told me about their failure case, and I almost used it, but the problem is their failure case was in fact, the fact that they damaged their own laptop to an extent that they couldn't get their code that they had been spending a lot of time working on back. And, um, they hadn't actually been using Git. And I don't know if you remember, but I actually did recommend early on, use Git, make sure you push everything up there. Um, I've had lots of computers fail on me in weird and strange ways. And I have to tell you that uh, my model now is that I don't keep anything on my laptop that I would miss. If I want it to be persistent, Ironically, I end up putting it in some sort of a distributed system, like a big old Dropbox or OneDrive. Nope. Instead, I decided since I picked on GitLab on Tuesday, I'd pick on GitHub on Thursday. GitHub has lots of different failures. They all have lots of different failures. I like this one because it once again reinforces this idea that the wrong time to figure out that you're Backup procedure doesn't work is when you're trying to restore. And this is a, a variation on that theme. The other thing I liked about this was this was a planned outage. They were using Raft. For their configuration database. My gosh, does this not feel like Project 5? 43 seconds to replace an optical device on some network thing, probably a switch. 43 seconds of downtime led to 23 hours of outage. Yikes. So when you are looking at those partition tests and swearing at them and going, this can't really happen, it does. And it can happen when it was planned. That's the best part. All right, so. Um, October 21st, 2018, just before, oh, actually, late, late evening. Um, late evening in Europe. Oh, that would be eight, seven or eight hours earlier here. This was on the eastern of the country, so it'd be early evening. So they decided to do it at basically at the end of the work day on the West Coast. That kind of makes sense. People are still up here, they're doing it, it's a little bit late, they're gonna make the switch over, everyone in Europe is asleep, people in the US have stopped working, um, and Canada, of course. 
except in Hawaii, but nobody cares about Hawaii. They're Hawaiians. Been to Hawaii? It's a great place to forget about, like, bullshit. This brief outage triggered a chain of events that led to 24 hours and 11 minutes of service degradation. A 24-hour outage for 43 seconds worth of maintenance work. I really liked that. Their infrastructure wasn't super complicated. They used My MySQL, MySQL, and something called Orchestrator. Orchestrator is their configuration database. It actually maintains the, it is the shard master of, of their system for all intents and purposes. And it used the Raft consensus protocol. So it was Paxos with a more understandable log model. The network goes down, Raft starts a leadership deselection. Because of course, whoever was leading is, is caught in a partition. Because it, it, most of the work was done in the East Coast, that's where they're replacing the opti optical links so the, the, the previous leader can no longer gain quorum or maintain quorum. So now, what do we do? We start failing things over, okay, so we, we end up with a leader in the West, West Coast area, we start failing things over to the West Coast clusters because those are still reachable and they can form a quorum. And then all the traffic starts getting routed to the West Coast. Everything's fine. But it turns out there were actually changes in the log on the East Coast that hadn't made it to the West Coast yet. This really should hit home, right? This is exactly what we were talking about. Like, okay, great. Well, this is. This is kind of a problem. Um, I think GitLab's problem was they cleaned their, their, their log prematurely, so they had state changes that weren't propagated correctly. Here we have state changes that weren't propagated correctly either. Ooh. And one of the reasons this happens is because most of the time we don't have partitions. Most of the time we don't have to worry about this. So most of the time what we do is we focus on making things faster. And in making them faster, we compromise correctness. Things start to come unraveled because there are increased latencies. The topologies have never been tested before because they haven't tried this kind of a failover previously. Um, and they decided ultimately to degrade their service offering rather than to compromise consistency. This was a manual decision. This was no longer an automated decision. And they start restoring databases from backup because they're kind of screwed. You've got databases that are no longer in sync. Your distributed systems protocol, as fancy as it is, has now failed you. And what do you do? You go reach for your backups. That's when you know things are bad. That's when you know that something is actually broken. They started the restoration shortly after midnight, UTC. So in the very early hours of the day in Europe. October 22nd, they'd still be on, no, they actually would be um, on standard time. They move off of uh, daylight time in mid-October. We do it in November. It took them 23 hours to restore the data from a 43 second network disruption. So my takeaway, recovery is really the hard part. It's the hardest piece to test. And the one thing that I remember from building logs myself was I built an infrastructure for testing recovery. And the way that I did that was very simple. Anytime there was a persistent change, I would snapshot and make sure I could recover from it. And by golly, you know what? It didn't work initially. There were several of us in, in that development team, and we all ran it on our workstations at night. So it would just run all night, and it was automated. So it would run, it would check to see if we could get back to a consistent state, and we had multiple levels of consistency. Um, and so it would, it would test at each of those levels of consistency. And if we ended up with a state where we couldn't recover correctly, it would save a copy of it, and then it would go on, and it would put the next one in. Because the system was still running, we just wanted to simulate failures. And essentially, I was just taking cuts over and over and over again and saying, is this a consistent cut? And if it's not a consistent cut, can I get back to a consistent cut? And if I find one where I didn't, there's something broken. 
And even in spite of that kind of testing, there were still issues that we found where there were logic issues. I like to say that transactional systems are easy to build and difficult to get right. And this is a key reason for that. So I know you've spent time dealing with these logs, building these replication protocols, cursing and swearing at your computer endlessly, no doubt, the occupational hazard. Um, we have a hate-hate relationship with our computers. They hate us, we hate them. And we torture each other continuously. Today we're going to talk about peer-to-peer -peer and mobility. That's not right. No, today we're going to talk about um, data analytics. Apparently I copied the wrong slide in there. I think I had some weird issue here. We're going to talk about data analytics, and specifically we're going to be talking about two different approaches to this. One is called MapReduce, and I bet you've heard of MapReduce because it was very popular, very heavily used by Google. And the other one we're going to talk about is Spark. They are both data analytics techniques. They use distributed systems in order to provide scaling. So a lot of what we've been talking about is performance. Uh, I'm sorry, it's correctness. We're talking about making sure that we have replicated copies of our database in order to allow us to recover from failures. But in this instance, we actually want to have multiple distributed services doing things in a way that makes it go faster than we could ever do with a single computer. That sounds really easy, but in fact, um, Frank McSherry's paper, which I have pointed out called Cost, is great, in which he took uh, clusters that were doing graph processing, and, and clusters up to 100 computers, and he was able to run it faster on his MacBook. And his point was, algorithms matter a lot. And I've talked about the fact that moving data around is really expensive. And you're going to see this when we look at Spark. So a very common technique for taking large problems is to split them up into small problems and then solve the small problems and then combine the results. There are both strictly correct ways of doing this, and there are approximation techniques. So it depends on how much error you want to tolerate. Have any of you heard of machine learning? I know it's a rhetorical question, right? I made this comment last time, and it's still true, and it's been true for a while. The reason that machine learning can do anything now is because we built distributed systems underneath that make what look like really big computers that take the machine learning models, largely neural network models of various types, and distribute them out. So we get neurons in different places, and they communicate with each other. And of course, that means we've got lots of messaging going on. We have lots of potential failure conditions, partial failures. Sometimes we use stale data because it's too expensive for us to go fetch the most recent version of something. And we know that it's approximately right. And so we allow a certain amount of error to creep into those. And there's a, there's a whole balancing act that goes on around that. But these are distributed systems. The reason that we have a chat GPT-4 is because there are a lot of systems people there building the infrastructure necessary to even train those models. We don't have computers big enough. When I mentioned last time about the 70,000 node, 70, node cluster, um, Andy sent us a picture when he was down there looking at it, a super micro down in the valley, uh, Silicon Valley. He sent this picture, and it's just the huge rows of racks of computers after computers, but it literally looks like a single 70,000 node computer. And that's what the kind of computer that you end up using to train these very large models on. That's one of the criticisms, right? That's a lot of, a lot of energy usage. I'm glad I don't have that power bill. How is that? So we have to split the data up. We have to spread it out across these nodes because we don't have that much storage attached to the nodes. Sometimes we keep multiple copies of the data, but we also may very well have just a copy here or maybe a copy here and here, but not over there. 
moving that data from where it is to where we need it becomes extremely expensive. As you might have noticed in Project 4, there are some tests where they send large keys. I mean, like 100K. That's not a large key. Six terabytes, that's a large key. But it's only a large key if you actually only have 100 terabytes of storage. If you're actually sitting there on 50 petabytes of storage, six terabytes, you're like a drop in the bucket. That's like a video on your, on your laptop. Anybody know what comes after petabyte? You know what comes after exa? Hmm, good. Anybody know what comes after zeta? Yada. Yada byte is currently the largest number we actually have. Um, and these are all formal standards uh, from the ISO Committee on Absurdly Large Numbers, which I keep trying to get appointed to because, you know, it's great to go to Hawaii to have meetings to talk about what comes after yada. I'm joking about the, it is an ISO standard, but I am joking about the meetings in Hawaii for now. Um, at the rate we're going, so right now the entire world has less than a yada byte of data. The last I looked, we had somewhere in the like tens of zettabytes, maybe, maybe 10 zettabytes. But our rate of data, just the data we accumulate, continues to double about every 18 months. So that's kind of a staggering, staggeringly large number. Uh, it, it's really hard to explain that number to people. Um, we got lots of data. It's all over the place, and it's expensive for us to get it. Um, I've been working on this poster, and one of the things that I read was that 25% of all assets um, can't, uh, 20, no, 25% of time spent creating assets is for creating things you've already created. Like, that's a pretty staggering number. And the reason they do that is because you can't find it. So I'm really happy about the fact we got lots and lots and lots of data because it validates my research. But it's also important for these kinds of problems because we have to think about the fact that we don't put that all in one place. We scatter it all over the place. We have multiple copies of it. We have to keep them in sync. We have to move that data to where we need it. So it's great to break these problems up, but they need to be, um, but he mentioned Mark Greenstreet's description, embarrassingly parallel. They also need to have very high locality. So they not only need to be embarrassingly parallel, and fortunately embarrassingly parallel and very high locality tend to go together. The data, you, you can't work well in a model where the data is scattered all over the place. Because the cost of getting it into where you need it is very high. We use this for load balancing, decomposition of the problem into smaller pieces. We have dependencies in our data because there's actually a linkage between this and this other thing. And so now we need to send messages between them to keep them in sync. That's our neural network because, of course, our neural network, the inputs of one layer are the outputs of another layer. Well, if those are implemented on separate computers, I need to move the output of one to the input of the other. Now, obviously, I can put them on the same, same computer, and that solves some of that problem. But since I made this, I, I decomposed this problem to try and allow me to scale up, periodically, I am going to have to cross those boundaries. Choosing where to cross those boundaries is one of the struggles and challenges that people who build these systems actually have. And of course, um, a lot of this depends on the application. What is the application doing? How is it using it? Another common technique is to pipeline things. We divide the work into small tasks, and then we farm it out in parallel. Um, actually, no, this is not so much parallel as it is. We, we, we piece it up, and we put it into a queue, and we process everything. So like that whole data locality thing, we process the stuff where the data is local to this node. And then we move that over to another processor, and we then do it there. So we, we chunk it up into, into pieces or units. We use this in factories, for instance, where we build things. Somebody sits there, 
and they take something from here and they do something to it and they put it there. And that we, we string those together and then that becomes a pipeline. In some ways, that's easier to deal with than the neural network. The neural network model is a really hard one. Uh, graph models in general are very difficult because it's often not a linear pipeline. It's often a, a walk of a more complex web. But if we can pipeline it, it's great. And usually what ends up happening is we find that we can get both of these things out of our, our problem space. We can take our problem, we can subdivide it, and then we can pipeline individual things within those subdivisions. So we'll, we'll see us mixing and matching these as, as we can. Pipelining is actually very popular for data streaming. Uh, have any of you heard of this thing called Twitter? So it turns out that for a very long time, Twitter has actually had one of the highest data volume pipelines in existence. Called the, 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 the Twitter data feed, where it's literally every single tweet that goes through the system. And it's massive. It's like literally like terabytes a second. And processing that in any kind of rational way is really difficult. But this is what streaming data looks like. This is a problem that we see happen over and over again. There is a system called Kafka that is heavily used in order to deal with streaming data. When you go and you buy um, an airplane ticket, it takes time for them to process that because it's not actually instantaneous. It's actually put in a queue. And the, this, along with all sorts of other messages, get funneled into this queue and then eventually get processed, not necessarily in the same order in which the original event happened. That's fine. We've been doing distributed systems long enough this term so that you, you should be comfortable with the idea, ah, we can just reorder things. It's okay. We just have to decide what the order was on the way out, not on the way in, which is kind of counterintuitive because that's normally not the way we queue things. Move the queue further in. Sort of like walking into the bank and, and you know, randomizing the order of the customers and then picking them out. And then we have an ordering at the end. Very right, fine. A little weird. We do a lot of that kind of thing. The benefit of this is that it actually improves the throughput of the system overall. Um, if we do a lot of early queuing, then it leads to certain patterns that slow down our performance. You, I'm sure you've been stuck in a line behind somebody who's got a really long running transaction at the bank. You know, going, I just wanted to put money in the bank. Take me three minutes. I've already spent 30 minutes waiting for this person in front of me. Do their really complicated transaction from Nigeria. Uh, we can build models of data processing that are actually themselves parallel. So we take a problem, we try to craft that problem in a way that it is parallelizable. Maybe the problem isn't originally parallelizable, but we come up with clever ways of actually making it parallelizable. This is in some ways what we do with MapReduce. We take a problem that is way through this large data set and count things. And so, the data set itself doesn't have any inherent locality, and it isn't obviously parallel, but we can bludgeon it into a model where we can make it be more parallel. And the lack of locality is something we can compensate with by uh, doing a lot of pre-processing. Anybody done any data analytics? You know what the hardest part about dealing with data is? Cleaning. Bloody cleaning. You say, well, how hard could this possibly be? And then you start looking at the data and you realize it was collected over a period of six months. And somebody kept changing the, just tweaking the way that the data was collected a little bit. So, oh, look, we added a column at some point. Well, what am I supposed to put in there for the old data? And somebody else decided that the time was going to change. And so now you can't compare timestamps. Um, I've been running these analyses of cloud storage providers, and they, they all have a cryptographically secure checksum. They just don't use the same value. What am I supposed to do with this?
In model parallelism, we divide our state across our nodes. Um, we keep the processing that's done on an individual node as small as, uh, as we reasonably can. And then um, we pass the input set to the nodes, and then we combine the results at the end. And for some problems, this works really well. Uh, PageRank, which is the, the Google algorithm for determining why your page should be displayed before other pages. The old algorithm. The new algorithm is how much did you pay us? And that one's a much easier algorithm for the business people to figure out, but not the tech. You guys have heard of Google, right? And I've told you the David Sheraton story already. So. Um, I actually have looked back. The original Google search page was google.stanford.edu, believe it or not. This is what happens when you go to grad school. You could actually end up inventing some really complicated algorithm like counting all the places, all of the links to a given page and using that as the uh, voting algorithm for whether or not the page is useful. And then, of course, you build a company around it and then the MBAs come in and they say, you know, we've got a better metric. How much are you willing to pay us to put your page up at the top? Easier. They don't need this distributed system anymore, do they? They just need a distributed bank account. Ah, we got them. We're still going to replicate their database. We still got a job. MapReduce is a paper from 2004. The um, operating systems design and, gosh, I don't even know what I stands for, but whatever. Um, If you're not doing anything in mid-July, you can go to Boston and go to OSDI, where they will be presenting lots of interesting papers on operating systems, including distributed systems. I don't think, I think they've published what's going to be played yet, but people continue to work in this area. It's, I, I don't know if you've noticed, but some of these papers are, are within your lifetime now. It's not like we're talking about old knowledge. Oh, four. That's probably about the age of the number of people in this. MapReduce was implemented in a project called Hadoop. And that is an open source Apache project. And you can still go use and download Hadoop. Uh, Amazon Web Services uses MapReduce as well. I'm sure that Azure does. Those are the two biggies. It's a very common algorithm, and I'm, I'd be surprised if Google wasn't implementing this in GCP. In MapReduce, what we do is we take a, uh, an input set that happens to be a set of key value stores. Gosh, we send it our key value database. Isn't this great? Then we have a mapping function that takes as its input a unique key value pair. And as its output, it gives us a new key value pair. Now, this is a really complicated mapping function, isn't it? Now, of course, the point here is we've got generality. We don't know what, what it did to generate that output set. That's kind of defined by what the application needs it to do. But the idea is very basic, very simple. We have key values in, we spit key values out. In the reduce function, we then take the output from the mapping function, and we compute our final result. This is really easy to see for page rank because what we actually end up doing is we end up dividing our data set up, web page, web page points to these, and then we count all of them up. Because what we want to know is how many people point to this web page. What is the in pointer value? And what we have is, what are the out pointer values? So we have all of the pointers to something, and we want to know what the value is of the pointers from something. Very simple kind of hand wavy sort of problem, but that is, in fact, exactly the problem they were trying to solve. We have a master. I thought that was a politically incorrect term now, which is why. GitHub doesn't, uh, doesn't use that as the default branch anymore. It's now main. Uh, but the, we, we have a controller. I'm not sure that sounds any better either. 
Maybe we should call it the dominatrix. Um, that actually would be a really good project name. Dominatrix, a multi-node controller algorithm featuring a raft. Although I do view stamped replication because, of course, that was Barbara Liskov. Uh, it orchestrates the workers. In other words, it actually figures out what the state of the workers are, what work they should be handling, and where their results should be going. It needs to deal with the I.O. Where are we getting the data from? If you think about it, we want to make sure that we're scheduling things to run on nodes where the I.O. is minimized. And this, this, this orchestrator has the insight, it's, it's kind of got the big global view, it, so it can know where it would be better to schedule things or move things. It also has to deal with failures. Ah, yes, back to failures. Oh my gosh, he never stops talking about failures. Reality is that when you get a whole bunch of these distributed nodes working on this stuff, some of them are just not going to cut it. There's going to be something that makes them slow, there are going to be things that make them just disappear. Whether it's a 43 second network outage because we had to replace an optical link, or it's because the cleaning person unplugged the rack so they could plug their vacuum in. Real world story I've actually told, I think. Um, word count is a classic example here. That's basically what we do when we want to know what the frequency of words are. So what, what we end up doing is we end up building these data sets where we have lots of the, the, the works that we're trying to consider for word count. And that becomes our input. Well, this book has these words this many times, and this other book has these words this many times. And then you want to compute all of this stuff together. So in our input, we have a key, which is a file name, and then a, the word, the content that we actually have. And we probably have multiples of those, uh, multiple, well, we would have multiples of those entries because we'll have different words in books. Most books don't contain just one word. You'll notice I was very careful to qualify that because I'm sure there's some book out there that has one word in it. Um, and in our reduce function now, what we take is our keys, a, a set of keys that have the words, and then how many books actually had that word. And now we can figure out how many actual references to this word we had. So now we have a word frequency graph or some data set. This is how we do page rank. Um, this is how you can do inverted indices. Show me all the things that contain this word. And these are very frequently used when you're doing any kind of search for anything. The way we find them is by going back to an index. See, it's an e-value store with an index on top of it. That's all databases are. It's just really expensive in some cases for us to compute that index. If you've ever added an index to a, 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 an RDBMS, you'll know it actually takes a lot of time because it often has to read all of the data and brute force build the index. Once the index exists, then you can incrementally update it. So you don't really notice the, the cost or the performance hit for that. But the initial addition of it, expensive. There are special kinds of databases that actually optimize the ability to add additional data elements. You're adding a new column, and there are sparse column databases. And the reason that we make them sparse is because we don't want to actually pull them all and have to actually add these real values in there. Because otherwise, you're back to this. If you don't have a sparse, sparse column or row database, then you add more columns. You have to go and talk, touch everything in the database, which you could in theory, do with this. All right, so MapReduce actually combines all of these data techniques that we were talking about, the common ones. So we have parallel data tasks, we use pipelining, and we use model parallelism.
our data flow model is the, the way that our data flows through the system determines the order in which we execute things. One of the challenges in Project 5 is this idea of sharding. So you want to load balance, but there's a cost associated with load balancing in that you have to now move entire blobs of data from one storage area into another storage area. I'm trying to remember, it, it, learning together, I think it was this class, somebody was asking about um, what you do with requests when you've got a reconfig event going on in your shard, in, uh, in your shard master, right? So somebody's moving a shard from one shard group to another shard group. And the simple, naive way of doing this is you just simply ignore any requests for that shard while you're moving it. Because you don't know whether it's still living in the old shard group or the new shard group. And a, a slightly more sophisticated way of doing this, and this is one that I had to implement decades ago, uh, was that, so in this distributed file system we were working on, we would literally have a piece of a, of a name tree. And we kept these, these, these pieces in what we called um, a volume initially, but that collided when we redid the next version, so we called it a file set. Fine, whatever. It was basically just a piece of namespace. And you'd, you'd, you'd link all of these namespaces together, so you'd have one massive globally distributed hierarchical namespace. How hard could that possibly be? And one of the reasons that people really liked this was because you could actually take these individual sets of files, you could put a quota on them. You could say you can't have more than X number of stuff in there. So we give you a home volume file set. We give you a home file set and we can say, sorry, you can't store more than, on the time frame, it was like five or 10 gigabytes probably, maybe even 100 megabytes, I don't know. It wasn't that much, a lot, pretty small. Um, well, okay, your systems administrator notices that one of the servers is filling up. So we have a load imbalance issue. So we need to move essentially what is your piece of this large store, we need to move it someplace else. And the way that we would do that is incrementally. We would actually stop, or no, we wouldn't stop. We would, all right, I take it back. We'd stop, we'd make a clone, a snapshot copy, and then we'd let it continue. So you could keep using your files, we would then make a backup, we would move the, the snapshot over to the new location. And then at the end, we would stop all the activity and we would do an incremental backup, i.e. what has changed since the snapshot, and we would move that over. So the disruption to you was very small and you normally wouldn't notice it. Whereas if we had actually stopped you from doing anything up front, we would have interfered with your use of the system. Either of those solutions is correct. One just has much less impact on the, the person or the people or the services that are using that system. And this is what makes things more complicated. It's really easy to often say, you know what, I'm just going to throw everything away for the next 24 hours and while I restore from, from this backup thing and you just, sorry, you can't actually do any useful work because I'm github.com and nobody uses github.com. So we don't do it that way. So we make things more complicated. This is a very common theme in distributed systems. We end up making things more complicated because availability to us becomes really important. The risk of availability is we sometimes go a little overboard and then we end up with conditions where, yeah, we've made this so available to you, we've compromised correctness. The design decisions in MapReduce revolved around all of these ma master data structures around tracking. Where are things currently scheduled? Where is the data? What tasks have completed? What tasks still need to be done? When's the last time I heard from somebody? All of that stuff. We've been doing many of these things in the projects as it is. We have this additional consideration of locality. The data locality is really important here. Uh, what I'm not talking about here is that underneath MapReduce, they actually had a distributed file system called the Google file system. 
and they had a global view of that data. So everyone could access the data. The difference was some nodes already had a copy of the data close to them, and some nodes didn't. And if you didn't have a copy of the data close to you, you had to go fetch it. And since it wasn't close, it meant it was more expensive. It's the difference between having something on your desktop and having something in a filing cabinet. You know, your desktop, you just open your laptop and it's right there, right? Filing cabinet is like this physical thing. You have to actually go someplace, pull some file out. And that's kind of an extreme example, but that really does happen in the real world. There is actually data that is still sitting on pieces of magnetic media that are super, super hard to get to. Anybody in here know anyone who's studying astrophysics? Turns out the astrophysicists have been collecting astrophysics data for longer than I've been alive. That's a long time. And there are people who still access that data. They will actually go and pull all the data off of magnetic tapes and look for information in there that they can use to support their theory of some particular astrophysical event. And that's an extreme example, but it is an example of why we don't actually throw this stuff away. It's that fear of missing out. And the cost associated with not having things locally. Ah, well, why don't we just keep it all on SSDs or NVMEs? Actually, it's a good question. Why don't we just simply keep everything close to us? Have you ever seen the show Hoarders? You can turn into a digital hoarder. You can keep all of that data on your laptop. You have to keep getting a bigger and beefier laptop. What's the problem with this? I can stand here and wait for you to give me an answer. Costs, right, exactly. Gosh, it's like money goes makes the world go round. I've been whining about Google and their, the fact that PageRank has been replaced by, um, please insert your credit card here. And it's all about cost. It's totally about cost. The cost of keeping data close to, to where we need to use it is, is really high. If you actually go work in data centers, they still use way more hard drives than they actually use um, solid state media. Solid state media is only used for things that are hot. It's too expensive otherwise. And I can go buy way more rotating solid state, rotating media than I can solid state media with the same amount of money. But it's not ideal when we're doing something like this. So we have this migration problem. That's a whole separate issue, but it is in, involves distributed systems. Task granularity. There's this interesting trade-off between as we make the tasks more fine-grained, we increase the amount of management overhead, because now we have lots more tasks to manage, but we make it more flexible in how we schedule things, and it also makes, more makes them more recoverable, because if the tasks are really small and one of them fails, you just restart the task. As the tasks get larger, the cost of a failure goes up. And now you have to think about, OK, well, what am I going to do to deal with that failure to make sure that doesn't cost me too much? So it's, it's this never-ending, shifting quicksand of trade-offs. This is a great place to have a job, because there's a lot of job security, because what works today will fall apart five years from now, because the the environment you're working in will change. If we go to coarse granularity, we don't have as much management overhead, but we have lots of other uh, ancillary problems. Faults happen. The more moving pieces we have, the more likely it is for us that one of them is going to fail. And yet this is, we are capable of putting a single device into an extraterrestrial orbit with 354 independent points of failure, where if one of those had failed, that device, which cost $10 billion to build, which is even now still a decent amount of money, 
if one of those had gone, it would have at least degraded or possibly completely scrapped that project. Can you imagine designing a project with 354 independent points of failure? You do distributed systems long enough, you will know that 99.9999999% working systems have failures. You will see failures. In that whole five nines thing, I just like, what is it? I think that um, there are like at 11 nines now, and they still see failures. They're just rarer. And when they happen, they're catastrophic and they take 24 hours and five minutes to recover from <laughs> or longer. And if, if the um, James, Webb James Webb telescope had actually failed, the, the cost or the time to recover that probably would have been another 10 years and 15 or $20 billion. So we have to build fault tolerance into our systems. We have to be able to recover from small errors without it compromising the integrity of the overall system. We build redundancy in. We simulate these things. We say, what could go wrong? How many times did you have to rewrite, I don't know, your Project 4 solution because you ran into a failure you hadn't really anticipated and you had to sit back and think about how am I going to deal with this? I know that's terrible. This is an awful way to, 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 to punish you like this, but that's actually a reality. That's what we deal with all the time. In our failure semantics, how important is consistency? I have actually talked about eventual consistency, and eventual consistency models are closer to the extreme where we say, yeah, well, you know, um, we'd rather have availability than, than absolutely strict correctness. There are even weaker consistency models. We see them, and when I was talking about, we can, we can begin to realize that we're introducing some small amount of error and we uh, decide that we can tolerate that. And it's hard. When you start sitting down and trying to compute how much error you're, you're injecting into a system where you allow things to be out of sync, you're going to find it's really difficult to, to properly model and conceptualize of what those errors do over time. Anybody ever use floating point numbers? Floating point numbers are a great example of where approximations can actually screw up big time as small errors accumulate. That's why I say it's actually hard to make that work right. One of the reasons we like strong, consistent models is that are really easy to reason about. They're just not super performant. So what are our failure semantics? Uh, well, that's what I just talked about. Well, how are we going to back this thing up? How do we do backup? If we think something might be failing, could we back it up at that point? If we have something that's very critical, do we actually just simply do it twice in parallel? So we hope that one of them works right. And since these are computations now, we could actually do that. If we have particular pieces of our pipeline where we know that there is a higher rate of failure, we could actually orchestrate to have two copies of them and take the one that finishes first. And you will see these kinds of things in the real world. And they had to address some of this in the MapReduce paper. There are lots of limitations in, in the MapReduce model. Um, you can't you have to deal with failure because you can't really afford to keep starting all over again. Once the rate of failure goes high enough, the likelihood you're going to finish this in your lifetime will asymptotically approach zero. And that's not acceptable. You have to find some balance between these things. Increasingly, what happens is as you add fault tolerant mechanisms in there, you, you create recovery points. That means that you have to have the data at that point so you can start all over again. So now you're storing intermediate results. Well, now you've increased the size of your data space. And one of the interesting observations in MapReduce is that often the intermediate states are way bigger than the initial data set. Any of you actually done message serialization? data serialization where you actually put it into a format where you can store it someplace and recover it reliably after the fact. 
Turns out this is a big problem. It actually takes a lot of time and energy. And why does Java have the Lombok package in it? It'll serialize stuff for you. It generates all the code to do this for free. It's not actually free in terms of the execution cost. It just means you don't have to actually sit down and write this. When we start doing things on the network, uh, your Mac and what processor do you have in that one? Is that Intel? Right. They don't even actually order their bytes in the same way. Actually, they probably do now. They didn't used to, now they do, because of course Apple changed the CPU. Went from RPC to Intel, now they're on ARM. So we have processors that don't even order their bytes in the same way. And we are going to send network packets across the interwebs. And we have computers that use 32-bit integers, and other computers use 64-bit integers. Um, and we've had weirder numbers than that. And how do we get these things to communicate with each other? So we, we build them in a form that allows us to interpret them without ambiguity. That's really all serialization is. Like we encode them as XML. Although I would argue that XML came out after we started encoding things because we learned how hard it was to actually get clean representations. So we have a whole serialization issue we have to deal with. We have to worry about how do we get data that isn't local to this machine? Um, MapReduce actually used, as I said, the Google file system. So they had a model. Ah, it's all available. Pay no attention to the fact that it might take you a lot longer to get that data. You can see how this is, there's a lot of nuances and complexity going on here. I mentioned the data amplification problem. Uh, oh, and the other interesting point here is that because, of course, we're amplifying our data and we've got lots of this stuff and we don't have an infinite bucket of money, we don't actually necessarily use the best in class storage. Hey, we got this really cool sale on slightly used hard drives. They weren't really big, but we can strap them all together and they kind of pretend like they're a big hard drive. And this is awesome. I don't know, what, any of you ever actually acquired a hard drive before? I mean, you can still buy them. They like make 20 terabyte hard drives now and they're like 500 bucks. They make bigger ones too. So their point is that you can't design assuming that everything is in the highest speed storage. You actually have to design things to account for the fact that the cost of replication is you're using lower cost storage and you have to find ways of doing that effectively. Let's look at Spark. So Spark is a system built for handling streaming data. So MapReduce was really about static data sets where we're doing analysis over a static data set and Spark moves beyond that and says, how do we deal with things when it's a fire hose? It's literally what they call the Twitter Twitter feed was the Twitter fire hose. I don't know if you've ever actually tried to drink from a fire hose, but it is slightly challenging. Maybe some of you have had a dog where you let the dog drink out of the garden hose. Sort of the same thing, you know, they kind of stick their tongue in and lap a little bit out each time. And the fire hose is just more extreme. So the challenge with the fire hose model is now you are being asked to process an awful lot of data very quickly in real time or near real time. Why does it need to be real time or near real time? Because if you fall behind, you're never going to catch up. You can handle small bursts, but if you're not handling more than the average rate, your system is going to perpetually fall further and further behind. And of course, that means that then when you try to restore your databases, you'll find out that there's stuff you didn't actually process. One of the key ideas in Spark was this thing called um, a resilient distributed data set. And the name is very suggestive, resilient. So it is, it 
can handle certain classes of failures distributed in that can be stored all over the network data sets in that it is some sort of a concrete or coherent set of information. So when this system came out, they said, look, we can do analytics 10 times faster than you can do with Hadoop. That's a pretty big deal. 10x is a big, big number. We have a broad range of workloads we can handle, including graph workloads, uh, streaming data workloads. Streaming was really a big winner for, for Spark uh, SQL. So our SQL database, you know, we're handling all sorts of, of operations. Machine learning, it supported lots of languages. It worked with a variety of platforms. And that is actually a link to the Apache Spark paper. Or actually, no, I take it back. That's a link to the Apache Spark website. The first link is to the paper. The second is to the Apache org's implementation of Spark, which is an open source version. And it's actively used. People do use some version of Spark today. The goals in Spark was to allow in-memory data sharing. Um, and part of the reason for that was because they wanted better performance and they knew that DRAM is faster than, than hard, hard drive storage, which in, uh, this is only 10 years ago, hard drive storage was pretty much the norm. Solid state storage was just finally starting to um, emerge. It's not like solid state storage hadn't been around for 30 years, but it took about 30 years for them to make it viable. Since you're reading from memory, there's no serialization cost. You don't have to worry about how you actually store this stuff so you can put it onto a disk. And their goal was fault tolerance. They wanted to be able to handle faults. And so that they created this resilient distributed data set idea. It is an immutable. Immutability is really important here. In other words, you can't change it. And that simplifies a lot of things. It, if you start doing much work in this area, you will find that if you can assume that something is immutable, a lot of your problems go away. Think of your key value stores. If your key value store was immutable, all you'd be doing is get. It's really easy to keep your distributed database in sync when no one's changing it. That problem is too hard. I'm going to just simply wish it away. The downside of this, of course, is that if I actually want to mutate it, then it means I have to create a new data set. And the new data set becomes immutable. So we have these transformations. We operate on the data that's in stable storage, and we use um, map, join, and filter functions on other RDDs. So it's exactly what I just said, which is if I want to mutate the data, I create a new RDD. I don't change the old one. This is an, a common model. It's not unique to Spark. It's not like they introduced this idea. Good Lord, I was working on software many years ago to do um, nonlinear video editing. I don't know if you've ever heard of that, but that's basically how they make movies. So they shoot lots of different scenes, and then somebody sits in a room, and they used to do this on film. They used to literally take the film and cut it and splice it together, and now we do that digitally. What it means is that we never actually change the original media. If we want to introduce a special effect, we take the original media, we apply the special effect, we create a new copy. It's the same exact idea here. The things we create become immutable, and if we want to change them, we create a new version of it. It's great for the storage business. It simplifies things tremendously. It means that you don't have to worry about undoing your change. Undoing your change just means using the old data set. And this helps a lot. <clears throat> you can use these data sets using various actions, including things like count, collect, and save. Your RDDs then map back to their source. So I make that new version, and the, that new version has a reference back to the old version, and probably tells, well, it should tell me how I got here. So there's a reproducibility aspect of this. These are the 
uh, the actions that I applied to this old data set and I got this new data set. So we're building in some sort of additional provenance information. This is where it came from. This is how I got it. Simple idea, and yet it turns out to be very powerful. Spark doesn't control the persistence and partitioning of the data. That's actually something that the application does. It's part of the user's portion of this. You have a problem you're solving, you get to divvy it up. Spark doesn't actually divvy that data up for you. So it still makes it challenging. It's a hard problem, but we don't have to solve that in Spark. We let whoever's using Spark solve that. And I think that's a perfectly reasonable approach. So here we go, we've got a example of console log mining. Now see, when people talk about logs, this is the other kind of log they often think about, which is, I did this, 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 on and on and on. And often these are text. They're, they can be quite large, and because everything starts with, I did this, highly compressible. Um, it's not uncommon, even your in, individual websites will maintain this stuff and process it. By the way, that is a common example of a streaming data set, is you have a website, you go look at your logs, you're like, okay, well, what am I gonna do with this? If you turn into a large company and you have hundreds of web servers and dozens of pages and, and whatnot, well, probably the opposite, hundreds of servers and millions of pages, and tens of millions of accesses to those pages, you're collecting vast amounts of log data and you want to be able to analyze that. And so you feed it into a streaming data solution like Spark so that you can say, what's hot? What's not? What's working? What's not working? What are people looking at? What web pages are throwing errors at me? So you can do this kind of dynamic analysis that's why log processing is actually an important example. So, and look at that, gee, let's look for lines that have the word error in them. Because maybe, just maybe, those are actually interesting to us. So how do we do that in a way that is fast and scalable? How many do we have? And you can see, we started out with all of the lines from the individual logs, and then we filtered that to get our errors, and then we filtered that further to find the things that were on our Hadoop file system, which, was, which is um, the Hadoop implementation of the Google file system. What are the, which of those errors were from Hadoop? And now let's look at them based upon their time. Do we see some sort of time frequency information? You, know, you, you probably see, like you go look at down detector, that's essentially what it does, right? Boom! And now I can actually build my own little down detector by looking at my log files. And there you go. And this can be done in real time, or very near re real time. Very short lag. Um, there are lots of different examples of actions in with these resilient data sets. I don't... I'm not going to go into great detail because I don't think it really makes that much difference. It's just, here you go. There's lots of things you can do on these. Um, they all capture the same exact thing, which is I start with a data set, I perform some particular action on it, I end up with a new data set. Since we have lots of data sets, we can actually end up with dependencies between them. So as part of the input here, this isn't Spark solving this problem. This is the person using Spark or the program using Spark. Defines the dependencies within the data using a directed acyclic graph. Uh, is anyone here familiar with the concept of a directed acyclic graph? I work with file systems. We build minimum, minimal trees, minimal spanning trees which are always directed acyclic graphs. And then we put in cycles. It 
it's a great trick. You can mount one file system on top of another file system and mount the original file system on top of the one you just mounted. It's a sleazy trick, and it does actually create cycles. Um, it used to be that in Unix, you could actually create hard links to directories, which would also create cycles, which was a great way of breaking anything that assumed it had a DAG. Like installer programs that would run through and try to find copies of themselves on your, on your disk. And they would start at the top, and they'd go down, and they'd go back to the top because there was a hard link back. And then they would just end up in these infinite cycles until they blew up. It was awesome. It's like sending somebody um, a zip bomb. You know what zip bombs are, right? It's a file filled with a single character that compresses really small, but decompresses to something larger than your hard drive or your storage. Uh, minimizes dependencies as much as possible because the more dependencies there are, the less we have freedom in scheduling things. Because if you have a dependency, A has to happen before B, then that means we have to do A before we can do B. And if you get a lot of those, then you end up with, okay, everybody, we stop, we do this step, then we move to the next step, then we move to the next step, and you have a single step process that takes forever. That kind of defeats the whole purpose of having a parallel streaming data model. Very easy to do this, though, to screw it up and get something that's really, really slow. I don't know, have any of you ever written a piece of code only to find out that it's like, not fast, and then you look at it and you go, oh, of course, I did something dumb. Yeah. Well, you can do this something dumb with um, you know, 100 machines. Hence Frank McSherry's comment about if the algorithm isn't right, you could do it on your MacBook faster. And the reason you can do it faster on your MacBook is because data locality will win. Don't have to move things around. So we need to minimize the dependencies. That helps us optimize our parallelism and limit our I.O. contention. And this is all about what Spark was, was about. Um, so the goals of Spark were to use in-memory data, and we use a distributed shared memory model, or um, all sorts of things to keep our logs up to date, to um, persist our lineage information. Where did all of these RDDs come from? Where are they going to? Uh, we log core screen operations in order to allow us uh, reproducibility and recoverability, because of course those logs will tell us what we have to do if something fails part way through. This actually helps reduce how much data we have to store in, um, in our critical paths. It minimizes our I.O which op improves our performance. I mean, one of the reasons you get 10x is because you completely eliminate operation. Here's one of those dirty secrets of file systems, which I'm sharing not because you care about file systems, because it actually is to this point. Um, we actually don't write things back very aggressively. And the reason is that about half of what you create is deleted within 30 seconds. And the cheapest I.O. we do is I.O. we never do. So if you're going to delete it in 30 seconds, I want to wait 35 seconds before I start bothering to write something. It's a staggering number when you actually look at what computers do. They create this data. They would say, yeah, write this to this file. And then a few seconds later, they delete it. You know, like, I'm glad I didn't write that out because I didn't have to pay any I.O. costs for it. It's awesome. Um, you also get better control of the locality now. Uh, these RDDs are actually a great way of packaging related data together. And we don't have to define it. The user defines it. It, makes it. it kind of shifts some of the burden of the heavy lifting here, of figuring out what those boundaries are to the user. So if their problem doesn't make that easy, then okay, well, sorry. But it doesn't make it any... If your data isn't easily compartmentalized like this, there's nothing we can do inside of Spark to make it easy to compartmentalize. We haven't increased the complexity of the problem, and we haven't, uh, we can't really solve it any better than you can. RDDs had much better throughput. Um, 
and so this is you know picking different kinds of workloads and different storage systems. So HDFS, these are just all files, and they have um, relatively coarse grained. RDDs aren't are actually about the same same level of, of uh, coarseness, but they have much better write throughput. Uh, KV stores are really good for things that are fine grained, but they still have fairly low write throughput. You can build KV stores that have decent write throughput, but it's very specialized. I pointed to a paper about one that, that used the NIC card to talk directly to people's memory across computers. That was really fast. You could write these very fast in that system, but that's because it got rid of the storage piece. Right? I keep talking about how storage is slow. Well, Spark gets around some of that by shifting more of this into, into memory, but we still have some storage behind that because we still need persistence. But if you don't need persistence, if you're perfectly willing to accept that things are going to live in memory, then you can get much better performance. And where does that take us? Back to consensus algorithms. Because we're going to replicate that data that we've put in memory because we don't want it to disappear. The evaluation of Spark was that it was up to 20 times better than Hadoop for specific applications. Anything was iterative, things that related to machine learning, uh, graph processing. Guess what? If you're doing distributed machine learning, it's probably going to be running on Spark or something even newer than Spark. Because there have been a number of systems that have tried to improve on this idea. But the, the concept of RDDs still sticks around. You'll still see RDDs actively in use. For analytics, this actually turned out to be a 40x improvement. Huge win. It had better failure recovery, and they were able to demonstrate this is what, 2012, 2010? I don't remember. So it's within maybe just over a decade ago. Uh, they were able to, to demonstrate queries on a one terabyte database. Uh, sorry, data set, not database. One terabyte database. They were able to demonstrate queries that only took about five to seven seconds to respond. That begins to feel like near real time. You can be alerted fairly quickly that something's mol you know, melting down in your, in your very large collection of web servers. Amazon cares about this kind of stuff. If you can't order things, they want to fix that. They want to know that's happening as quickly as possible. There you go. This was a little peek into data processing at scale. Um, I only took three classes here, and the first one I took um, was called Data at Scale. And it was an entire term. It was all reading papers like the Hadoop paper and the, the, the Spark paper and even more after that. This is still an active, active area, not only of research, but also of active development. I'd say at least half of the papers that are published about uh, data analytics and whatnot come from the, the cloud providers themselves because this is an active problem. If you, I, I don't know where people are going to work, but if any of you end up working at any of the cloud providers, it is distinctly possible you'll end up working with or on these kinds of systems. Go. I think that was the slide that was supposed to be up front. <sighs> yeah, wow. All right, I did a great job on these yesterday. Any questions? Yeah, so you get a little glimpse into why, why all of these algorithms exist and what we're going to do with them, or what you're going to do with them once you get out of this class. Um, I don't know, does anybody have a job? They're, they're done here? You're going to be working on distributed systems? Yeah, interesting. So this is at least semi-topical. Anybody know what they're going to be doing? Besides trying to figure out how Git works, but you'll spend the rest of your career doing that. Cool. All right. That's it for today. And I'll see you next Tuesday. So you get two more lectures from me next Tuesday, and then we'll have a guest lecture 
the following week, one lecture from me. I trying to remember exactly when. There's only one more that I consider to be like really important, and that is the uh, Byzantine fault tolerant one, where we're going to talk about blockchain. And I will introduce you to a way to to, to lose lots of. Uh, sorry, uh, make me lots of money. You know, invest in my new coin. Just kidding. Don't invest in. Don't invest in um, blockchain currencies unless you really are willing to lose your money. 